reportedly underway between Japan and the U.S. And it looked as if a political breach had been avoided. The Pacific fleet lay peacefully at anchor below the pillowed sky, and our armed forces were enjoying shore leave at liberty. An alert from a radar outpost had been considered insignificant. But suddenly, warnings ignored as unimportant turned Hawaii's jewel into a holocaust of horror, devastation, and death. December 7th, 1941. Like the snap of a camera shutter, the date froze an entire generation of Americans for an unforgettable instant in history. 360 Japanese aircraft, torpedo planes, dive bombers, level bombers, and fighters struck Pearl suddenly with indescribable fury. into a boiling cauldron of hot oil, flames, smoke, and the blood of the unsuspecting victims. Many died that fateful day of infamy, but many lived to tell the story. And on December 7, 1966, many of these men returned to Pearl to relive and recount the stories, and in the words of many, found release from the frustrations, rancor, and bitterness that remained entrapped in the hearts of these men for 25 years. These men and their families came from the West to participate in the anniversary reunion week. But one who took part as an enemy returned from the East. Yes, a Japanese too remembers Pearl Harbor in a manner provocative to the American point of view. Here is the profoundly significant explanation of why one came back. Japanese torpedo planes came in low that day over Battleship Row. Special maneuvering techniques were employed that dealt a severe blow to the fleet. Eight battleships were put out of commission. 188 planes were destroyed on the ground. Only three of these ships were repaired at that time. Later, three others were salvaged. Other smaller ships were damaged. But the sting of over 3,000 U.S. Navy personnel killed or missing, and nearly 1,000 wounded, plus over 600 Army killed or wounded, was something which could never be repaired. This Japanese man was not only one of the 550 airmen who rained death that day on Pearl Harbor, but was the man who personally led this attack in a high-level Mitsubishi 97 bomber and skillfully trained these men for this mission. I cannot speak to them. They are gone. But I can speak to you. I was on a green mission that December day, a quarter of a century ago. Now I have come on another mission. 
a mission of far greater importance. There is something I must do. I must do it. These are the survivors of that December day. Men whose comrades lie buried here. And they have returned. They and their families. The living among the dead. To honor. To remember. It would be difficult for them if they knew I was so close by. I, Fujita, the Japanese pilot. Yes, very difficult. But if I could somehow make them understand, if you can understand, I do not ask them to forget. For how can anyone who has felt the hot breath of war, how can he ever forget? These men remember Pearl Harbor. This battle cry of World War II was much more meaningful to them than it was for millions of Americans on the mainland. They remember, and sometimes hesitate to recall the horror of that day. I was aboard the USS Arizona. Uh, I just finished eating breakfast, and uh, someone hollered up forward that the planes were bombing Fort Island. We went and took a quick look and automatically uh, start manning our battle stations, which my station was up above the bridge on the number two uh, anti-aircraft director as a sight setter. Uh, right away, I, I guess everybody automatically uh, knew that this was these were the Japanese. I recollect the first bomb hit us forward on the starboard side, which hit in a uh, gasoline storage and uh, was a very large explosion and of course uh, a ball of flame come up in our direction above. I believe there was ten of us that we crawled across the line to the USS Vestal. On that morning where I was up uh, on the signal tower we relieved the watch a half an hour early. This signal tower is in the Navy Yard in Pearl, overlooking Hickam Field. We could see all of Honolulu, all of Pearl Harbor, the air station, Fort Island. And uh, at 7.55, we had just run up the signal for preparatory to executing colors on the ships. When the first bomb hit at Fort Island, we were all amazed. We couldn't believe it we, until we saw the rising sun on the airplane's wings. After the dive bombers came in, we saw torpedo planes flying lower than the signal tower and coming in and launching their torpedoes. Hickam Field at that time was being strafed by the planes coming in, and the planes on the ground over there were being hit also. A lot of them bursting in the flame from being hit from the strafing. Our own planes were kind of trying to get off the ground. Our own gunners were shooting at uh, our own planes, trying to get off of the ground. No, we never did get in the air, and our planes were completely demolished. Uh, when I took off, I went to a place where it was open area, and just went down flat. And they were strafing all along the area, and we were right near the parade grounds. Well, I thought that uh, at first that they were on a goodwill tour due to the fact that we had uh, uh, been told that uh, the uh, Japanese ambassador was having a meeting with... Uh, uh, Mr. Roosevelt at that very hour in Washington. And uh, we'd received a message that morning from our patrol plane that he had sank a submarine just off of the entrance. And uh, when we received the message, uh, the duty officer had me ask the plane for a verification. We were in doubts that the plane was actually giving us a true statement. Asked for a verification, but we forwarded it on to the commander-in-chief and in the meantime, he had called Commander Ramsey. And uh, when the first plane came in and bombed the hangar, I was in the communication office waiting for the 
answer from the plane and we watched the first plane come in not knowing that it was a Jap plane and when it dropped the bomb I rushed back to my office and uh, Commander Ramsey had the message ready that read Air Raid Pearl Harbor this is no drill. One of the most incredible things in fact it was the most incredible thing that I saw that morning was uh, this uh, um, dive bomber uh, pulled out of a group of uh, 13 um, dive bombers circling Pearl Harbor and it uh, came in toward the uh, battleship uh, Arizona and it uh, all of a sudden it uh, went to three times its normal size as it let out perforated rain flaps and to me after it uh, just seemed to hover over the uh, Arizona it uh, dropped a bomb uh, and to me it looked like it went down the stack of Arizona and all of a sudden there was a tremendous explosion and the ship just went into smokes and uh, smoke and flames it seemed like from stem to stern. It was just a, a mass confusion we did get underway in about an hour to an hour and a half and proceeded out of the harbor in our defensive position of course I think the uh, the greatest fear in the men's mind over and above what all had already happened was that this was probably a softening up for an invasion which was surely to follow. Well, as I remember December 7th, I can put it in about three or four words. Uh, blood, guts, and burning oil and exploding shells. I was in a turret in the after section of the ship number four, so when, they, when we discovered that it apparently wasn't a, a surface attack, we had to get out of the turret and try to help the people who were in bad shape. So when I came out of the turret, the first thing I thought of it was my twin brother. We were from Minnesota. My twin uh, was on the anti-aircraft gun up near the stack. And uh, when I tried to go up there, uh, there was a tremendous explosion. And I couldn't get to him. I tried, but I couldn't make it. So on my way out, I grabbed one man by the hand. And I was blown through the air and hung out of this young man's hand. And we went clear through the air back to the number four turret area. When I came out, I still had him by the hands. I went back. I found my division officer, who was uh, completely split down the middle and dead and a Marine who had fallen through or had been blown through a ladder going up to the fighting tops was cut in little pieces. And uh, it was a difficult time trying to find one man who was whole because of the flash burns. The skin peeled off, you try to grab a man and haul him out of the fire and your skin came off in your hands. This is not a very pretty story, but that's war, I guess. This time I went to my battle station number four gun turret. Uh, it was uh, just the minutes later that uh, we'd taken a bomb hit on this turret ricocheted off and went down below and exploded. As we left the turret, we come out. The whole ship was ablaze. It looked like a living hell out there. So I ran out in the turret, and as soon as I got in the right upper handling room to put the earphones on, uh, everything went black. The ship blew and shook like a leaf. Well, you couldn't stay in there because the smoke was so thick and, uh, or, or gas, so you had to crawl out and get up and hang underneath the overhang. And then I, I know I looked ashore, and I seen some guys crawling on the beach, and I wonder how they got over there. I'd like to be over there myself. Looking up, we saw a, an aircraft peel off out of a broken to overcast sky condition. He swung around, and a big meatball hit us right in the face. We took off. Now, Bill went to the left, and I went to the right. And I've never seen Bill Shepard to this day. And we have this reunion here, and recollecting the past, I think this reunion is a wonderful deal due to the fact that a lot of us will get a lot of emotion that has been stored up inside us for years withdrawn. When we meet each other, we haven't seen faces for 25 years, and some of you see a face and you recall past events, and you state things that you had never, never divulged to your family. Uh, these men have uh, banded together for one, or I might say two specific purposes. One is to remember Pearl Harbor and keep America alert and hope that the uh, terrible thing which happened here on Oahu and at Pearl Harbor will never happen again on any American soil. Men gave their lives in other ways in that great war. Comedian Joey Brown was one of these. He visited more South Pacific islands than any other entertainer to provide a moment of diversion to the men occupied with the grim business of war. Well, of course, I was paid for it many times over. Just the laughter of kids that needed laughter so very badly at that time. My shows were, were not anything. I never figured out what I was going to say or what I was going to do, but I had a certain amount of stories and things that I, and 
clowning things that I did, but all on my own, and there was never, it was always fresh, because I never had a routine that had to go a certain way. It's the best way out there, because you never know when the shooting would start, or any something, it wasn't the shooting, because I don't think I was interrupted three or four times only in the shooting, where it was, I remember on Guadalcanal, that's strange, that the shooting started one time in the middle, so will you keep those people quiet out there? <laughs> and we went on, we went on. These kids, and this wasn't on Guadalcanal, it was near, it was across there, Tulagi. Yeah. And <laughs> these kids, well, they laughed. They thought that was the funniest thing in the world. And I've had many times I've met people that were there at different places like that and would come and remind me of it. I'd forgotten. <laughs> Anything good? Strange the thoughts that go through a man's mind. The changes time can make in a place, in a person. sunken Arizona. 1,100 men lie entombed in this ship. 1,100 lives. Mitsuo Fujita was sorry. He wished that he could tell them, but he could not. This had been war, and he was only carrying out the orders given to him by his supreme commander. Time is merciful in many ways, but it cannot dim memories. It can only tranquilize some of the pain of actual experience. It also heightens the urgency of my mission. A mission for which I seek no personal glory, no glory of empire, no earthly gain, but a mission which I want all the world to know. Captain Fujita remembers how he studied the scale model the Japanese military had made. The islands in accurate detail. He had memorized every prominent characteristic. They were as familiar to him now as on that morning of the attack. By mistake, the submarines had surfaced on this side, believing it to be Pearl Harbor. Somewhere in this area, Colin Kelly's plane crashed after the pilot's valiant effort to drive off the invaders. Japan did not want to occupy these islands. She only wanted to keep the U.S. Navy from obstructing her goals in the Pacific and the Orient. But I must be about my mission. I have something I must do. It is more compelling to my heart, much more than the passion for military victory that first led me to these islands. What does Pearl Harbor mean to these people? Do they remember that men died? Does it make any difference to them? Why should they think of Pearl Harbor? They were unborn that historic day. Life is carefree for them now. Pearl Harbor is only a page in their history books. But surely he remembers. Was he fearful on that day? Or angry? Does he wonder why men hate and kill? Does it matter to him? 
I must speak to them somehow to help them understand, as I now understand, that God does not see men as American or Japanese, not as yellow or black or white. God sees men as helpless children, struggling, seeking, stumbling, incomplete in themselves, needing the miracle of His hand upon their lives. Does it seem strange to you, a Japanese, a man from a pagan culture, speaking this way to what the world calls a Christian nation? But this is the heart of my mission. This is why I had to come back. I must tell you, somehow I must tell you, how God reached down in mercy and touched me, Mitsuo Fujita. I have searched for someone to help me. I have prayed, Mitsuo Fujita, who once did not know how to pray. And God has provided this man to help me. Mr. Dan Liu, Chief of the Honolulu Police Department. He is a strong man on the island. When he speaks, his voice is heard. And like me, he knows the miracle that comes to life when God reaches down in mercy and brings transformation. This man will represent me before the Survivors Association. The Furoshiki the traditional silk cloth in which gifts are wrapped in order to be carried. The design on this furoshiki speaks symbolically of long life. As the book of books speaks of the gift of eternal life. My gift, the word of God, which I want presented to those survivors of that day, it is because one of your boys, one of the men who flew with General Doolittle. It is because of him there was once hatred in his heart toward my people. But the love God gives, that love transformed the heart of Sergeant Jacob the Stranger. And through Sergeant the Stranger, and through this gift, this divine love reached me. Mitsuo Fujita. Captain Fujita, your story is a great thrill to me and I'm sure to people around the world who have heard it and who will hear it. When we think of what happened at Pearl Harbor and clear through the months and years to Hiroshima, we hear the voices of our beloved dead who are buried in the mud of Pearl Harbor and vaporized over Hiroshima. Their voices cry to us, but not for revenge and retaliation, but they call to us for reconciliation and reconsecration to a new way. And your coming here to me is like the coming of a wise man from the East with his gift to the Christ child and trying to show us that we must go from here by another way. Thank you so very much. We've gathered here to remember that day 25 years ago when the world was startled and shaken and stunned by the attack on Pearl Harbor. Hundreds of American men died that day. And of course, we remember them. Now it's 25 years later. Our world has radically changed. And I often ask myself, 
have we really learned any lesson from what happened at Pearl Harbor. There is one thing, however, that gives us tremendous hope as we look into the future. And I think it's exemplified in what has happened to Captain Fuchita, who led that attack on Pearl Harbor. Captain Fuchita has accepted Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. Christ has transformed his heart, and the man that was once our enemy is now our friend and our brother, and has been received in Honolulu by the state of Hawaii and at Pearl Harbor as a friend. And this, in my opinion, is a most remarkable thing. And this could only have been brought about through the gospel of Jesus Christ. Christ was called the Prince of Peace. When he died on the cross, he broke down the middle wall of partition that divides men. But without this acceptance of Christ, I do not see any possibility for world peace. And so today, the lesson that we learn here at Pearl Harbor, and the lesson we learn from Captain Fuchita, is that Christ, the Prince of Peace, is the answer to the problems that men face. And unless we come to know him, and unless we bow to him, we are going to have troubles and wars and rumors of wars from now on. Let us learn the lesson and receive Christ into our hearts before we have another Pearl Harbor. Do you now understand why I have returned? It is not to live again in memory the brief glory of Pearl Harbor. I've come back because of you, my friend. As Sergeant DeShazer was God's voice to me, so perhaps I can be God's voice to you. This is my mission. This is why I have returned to Pearl Harbor. Leading the squadron that fateful day was Japan's number one pilot, Commander Mitsuo Fuchita. And joining us now on the set is Jack Connor, an American who after the war became close friends with this Japanese war hero. Jack, what sort of man was Mitsuo Fuchita? Captain Fuchita was a fascinating man, Ted. He had a keen, analytical, nimble mind, able to make quick decisions. In fact, split-second decisions. He was not only the man who led this attack, but he worked with another Japanese commander named Minoru Genda, who was a brilliant statistician and tactician. And so with Genda, they planned the attack, but Fuchida actually was the man who moved in to lead the attack. Someone has said that Genda wrote the play, but Fuchida produced it. Now, Fuchita was in charge of training those 360 pilots that uh, participated in that. Fuchita did the training personally of those men, the pilots and the crew, of the 550 crewmen and the 360 planes. Uh, meticulous training. They picked out an area in Japan on Kyushu, one of the islands which resembled Pearl Harbor almost to a T and went through meticulous training that assimilated, that simulated the Pearl Harbor conditions. Yes, that's right. Um, Fuchita was a very, very capable man, qualified because he had been a career man in the Navy. He had taken part in the Sino-Japanese War. And then they pulled him in to this tremendous thing that they planned, knowing that they had a good chance of creating a surprise uh, surprise attack on Pearl Harbor. Now, you were telling me of a, an example of his quick mind during the attack. 
Yes, that's right. Uh, during the attack, uh, Pachita had already uh, dropped his bombs. Uh, he climbed to an altitude of about 8,000 meters, where he took a circling position. Uh, commanding the other planes, giving orders. It was a command post, so to speak. Uh, he saw that the low-level Mitsubishi bombers uh, were not striking their targets. They had to drop their bombs uh, from too high an elevation, which meant that they went into the mud of Pearl Harbor. Pearl Harbor is only 60 foot uh, deep. So suddenly he thought of a thing that he used to do as a boy. Uh, passing a pond or a stream, he'd pick up a flat rock and throw that rock on the water and it would skim and skip across the water. In just a flash, he thought of that, commanded his bombers to fly lower, to keep the tail of the plane down, and to let the bomb hit the water in an elevated position. And then it turned over and had a straight shot into the battleships that were destroyed. All of that during the heat of battle and... Uh, and possibly 30 seconds, yeah. uh, he decided upon that. Well, Fuchida's military service continued uh, during the entire war. He was in many battles and uh, seemed to live a charmed life. Now, tell me about some of those events. Well, he did live a charmed life. Uh, he survived all of the major battles uh, in the Pacific. He went through the Leyte Gulf Campaign, the... Uh, Marianas, the Lady Turkey shoot, and finally the Battle of Midway, the battle which doomed Japan. Now, he did not fly in that battle. He had taken ill uh, with an appendicitis attack, was operated on, on their way to Midway. So he was in the sick bay of the Akagi, his battleship, actually when the uh, attack took place. He heard the shooting up on the flight deck. He climbed the ladder. Uh, rather, it took a lot of strength for him to do it, climbed up on the flight deck, sat back against the bulkhead, and uh, sort of encouraged the young pilots as they took off with a band's eye, a long-lived life idea. Mm -hmm. Now, at Midway is where the kamikaze technique began, the suicide missions. The pilot would not only uh, drop his bombs, but then as a final gesture, he and the plane would take a nosedive into a battleship destroyer, whatever it happened mm. to be. This was kamikaze. So in the midst of that, Fuchita, still on the flight deck, uh, saw a plane approaching them. It was one of our planes, a Marine flyer. The plane went out of control, went for the stack of the Akagi. A Marine kamikaze. A Marine kamikaze, <laughs> you're right. He hit the stack, blew the Akagi to smithereens, blew Fuchita. 70 feet up in the air, mm. he came down, hit the ocean floor with both feet, submerged, came up a few seconds later, was rescued by a Jap destroyer, taken back to Japan where he sat out the war for a time. Mm. So that led him up to some other remarkable things that happened. Now, toward the end of the war, again as an example of his uh, charmed life, he was uh, nearby where one of the A-bombs landed. That's right. That. Chad, he had been called down to Hiroshima uh, to attend a conference of the high command, both of Navy and Army. They were anticipating uh, a defeat at that time, so they were preparing to make a last stand, not only with the Army and the Navy, but with civilians as well. Hmm. But Chita went down to help plan that whole thing only stayed a day, was called back to Tokyo, but while he was in Tokyo, within a 24-hour period, something happened, and that was the dropping of the atomic bomb. You mean he was in Hiroshima the day before, was called back to Tokyo? That's right. The bomb dropped. He, uh, providentially, I feel providentially, God got him out of that awful place before the bomb hit because all of these high command officers were wiped out. Mm. Japan had literally nothing left in the way of high command. So, but I think the Lord pulled him back to Tokyo. Well, then he, he went back the next day. Tell me about that. The very next day, 
Pachita went back to find out, try to find out what had happened. No one knew what had happened. There was a sus sus suspicion of some kind that a bomb had been dropped, but they didn't know what kind. So he went back into Hiroshima, not knowing about radiation poisoning and some of the things that happened after a bomb was dropped. He went in examining with another 11 men some of the remains of Hiroshima picking up objects out of the uh, the ash that had been created, the burning ash and all, examining that, and uh, went through that and finally determined through his brilliant mathematics, and he was a great calculus, he determined that a bomb had been dropped at about a 500 foot elevation by parachute, exploded over Hiroshima, and that's what created all this devastation. He himself figured that out. He left the scene about a day later after trying to determine everything that had happened, not knowing anything about the effects of radiation poisoning. The 11 men who went in with him within a year's time all had died of radiation poisoning. Pachita uh, went in and one of the you probably know that some of the effects of radiation poisoning is a loss of hair and a loss of appetite. Well, Pachita used to say that his appetite grew better and his hair grew thicker. Well, Jack, he indeed lived a charmed life because all of those other men died, didn't they, of radiation yes, poisoning a very soon? time, hmm. Chad. Uh, these men uh, did not survive over a year. Pachita lived on the remaining days of the war, and then played an important part in what happened at the close of the war. Jack, those seven days between when the bomb was dropped on Hiroshima and the Japanese surrendered, one on the 7th of August, the other on the 14th, something happened, and Mitsuo Fuchida was involved in that. Tell me about it. That's right. Japan was in a chaotic state. Uh, what was left of the army and the high command, what was left of it, wanted to pursue the war. They wanted to go on with it. Now, the emperor had wanted to surrender, but there was a, a fanatical group of military people who wanted to go on. If the war had gone on, literally hundreds of thousands could have been lost. Our own men, we could have lost a million men by that time. Because we didn't have a third bomb. <laughs> we didn't have another bomb. But Fujita was loyal to the emperor, and he used his influence in split-second decisions to get to certain people he knew were trying to accomplish the coup and convince them not to go ahead. They wanted it. to overthrow the emperor. To overthrow the emperor. Take over the government and prosecute the war. A coup d'etat. Uh -huh. uh, a coup d'etat, as it were. Fuchita was the man responsible for stopping that and following out the emperor's hmm. wishes. Well, thank God for that. Yeah. Okay, how did you get acquainted with this fascinating man. Uh, Ted, I, I did some work with the Pocket Testament League. That's a group back in New Jersey, and uh, their ministry is seeing scriptures given, passed out to people in the army. They visit army posts, uh, they visit troops when they're overseas on the battlefronts, and Fuchita was actually converted uh, through uh, receiving a leaflet from the Pocket Testament League. They were ministering in Japan. They were ministering the in Japan at the time. And then uh, after the war, Fuchita was brought back to work with Pocket Testament League, and that's where I was at the same time. And we became a team visiting army posts around the country. And you traveled with him for some three years, did you not? Off and on for a three-year period. Mm -hmm. I almost felt like the... Uh, the navigator on the Pearl Harbor run. <laughs> but uh, we shared many stories, and he was such a great guy to travel with. Uh, there was an intimate uh, fr uh, relationship and friendship. He told me many things mm -hmm. that probably he never divulged from a public platform. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's how you met Fuchida. How did Fuchida meet Christ? Well, I referred to a leaflet that the Pocket Testament League mm -hmm. passed out in Japan, and this was in response to General Douglas MacArthur when he saw this chaotic condition in Japan before it had returned to any sense of normalcy at all, uh, MacArthur knew he was going to have to do something to supplant a big vacuum that happened when uh, the emperor 
was not looked upon as divine any this longer. This would be in the early days of the occupation. The early days of the occupation, uh, the emperor was deposed, so to speak. Uh, MacArthur saw that something was needed. And I believe that the general was a very fine Christian gentleman. He saw that the answer lay in Christianity. Mm -hmm. He immediately sent back word to send missionaries as soon as possible, but even before they came, he said, send me a million Bibles. Now, those Bibles were quickly given out, and a few weeks later, MacArthur wired, send me 10 million Bibles. And so, at Shibuya Station in Tokyo, Fuchida had come in uh, to testify at war crime trials. MacArthur knew Fuchida, had great respect for him, because he knew Fuchida would tell the truth. Now, Fuchida was not a Christian at this time, but on his return to his home from Shibuya Station, a pocket testament missionary was handing out Bibles and Christian literature. And one of these leaflets was the story of Jacob de Chaser. Jacob de Chaser was the man whose story, after he had flown with General Doolittle, uh, was printed up in Japanese, a thrilling conversion story. Uh, Fuchida read this story and marveled at this man who was treated so badly by Japanese being willing to come back to his people. It so um, impressed him that he said, I've got to get a Bible, because he saw that the difference in DeShazer's life came when DeShazer received a Bible as he was imprisoned. He became a prisoner of war. That's right. A Japanese prison. And at that time, he had bitter hatred toward the Japanese, didn't he? He hated the Japanese from the moment of Pearl Harbor. He was a new recruit in the Air Corps, as it was called at that time. And from the minute of Pearl Harbor, he had intense hatred wanted to get back at the Japs. Mm -hmm. And so uh, he was picked out by uh, General Doolittle and others who trained men for their retaliatory raid, mm -hmm. don't you see? So uh, Jake DeShazer made the flight. Uh, his plane and others in the Doolittle group ran out of gasoline. He was forced to parachute. Uh, he was captured and then imprisoned for a period of four years. At the end of the four years, Jake DeShazer felt that he wanted to come back. After having been converted in prison, he wanted to come back to the Japanese who had treated him so badly, but he felt that the need in their lives was to receive the Christ that he had received in prison. And so upon returning to the States, going through a short-term missionary training, he returned. But before he returned, his story had been printed up. I was a prisoner of Japan. This is a story that Fuchida received. And he saw that the difference came in Jake's life when Jake read the Bible. Fuchida said, I've got to get a copy of the Bible. Uh, it was some time before he was able to receive to get one. Now, Jake DeShazer forgave the Japanese. And that's really the, the hook that got into Fuchida's heart, that there was a power somewhere strong enough so that this man could forgive his enemies. That's right. The hook got, the Lord got the hook into Jazer there in prison. Yeah. And as Jake was reading from Matthew one day, he came to the crucifixion scene. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. The words of our Lord. And Jake immediately saw his own condition before the Lord, a sinner, lost, undone. And he just raised his heart and eyes in simple faith to the Lord and said, Father, forgive me, for I didn't know what I was doing. And that was actually, that little phrase was incorporated into the leaflet, the tract. Mm -hmm. And this was the tract that was handed to DeShazer, uh, uh, to Fuchida, to, uh, to Captain Fuchida. Fuchida. Yeah. And then Captain Fuchida, after he had read this story and got a Bible, came to the chapter in Matthew himself of the Lord's looking upon the crowd below him and saying, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Immediately, Pachita saw his need and said, Father, forgive me, for I did not know what I was doing. So it is a story of forgiveness, of compassion. The reason that Jake DeShazer went back to Japan and the reason that Captain Pachita came to us, uh, an Asiatic coming to a Western world, to tell the story of Jesus. 
So therein lies the story of love and forgiveness. Mm -hmm. Let's uh, take another step back and talk about this event. Uh, you mentioned Doolittle's name. And uh, tell us about that. Who's, yes. Who's Doolittle? And well, General Doolittle was a World War I ace. He was a flyer uh, in France. He was a, a champion of our Air Corps, as it was called at that time. And General Doolittle came back after the war a hero, I would say 1920, became a very successful businessman, kept up his flying in what was then, I suppose, known as the National Guard. And at the uh, opening of World War II, and especially after the bombing of Pearl Harbor, he was immediately called upon to train a special crew of some, well, the men who manned 16 planes to uh, uh, perform a retaliatory raid on Japan. A little uh, surprise it was on a, our part for them. It was a surprise attack, and it was had a tremendous effect upon the Japanese. It was stunning. They had no idea where these planes came from. Now, President Roosevelt at the time jokingly said that the raid, the planes came from Shangri-La. You may remember that was a famous yeah. book and the plot of that. But the, uh, this was the thing that jolted the Japanese and at the same time gave us a boost because America... It was a moral, morale booster for oh, us here. It was tremendous. We needed that after having suffered that Pearl Harbor attack. It got America on the ball, so to speak, once again. And then the expression that came out of Pearl Harbor, remember Pearl Harbor, became the war cry of the nation at the time. And I think was responsible for us going in and becoming victorious on so many of our campaigns, especially in the Pacific. So the success of Fuchida's raid, such a surprise, so successful, the Pacific fleet was crippled for six months, and that was really their goal to keep the American fleet out of uh, uh, aggressive action for at least six months. That's what Fuchida often said to me. Uh, I said, did you expect to go on and perhaps invade the mainland of America? He said, not at that time. Our objective was to cripple the fleet, try to knock out the gasoline, and incidentally, that was one of the targets that he saw after he'd completed his mission of bombing the battleships. He yeah, he wanted to go back for another attack, he gas wanted, up and load up and... He wanted to go back, but Admiral Nagumo didn't want to risk the man or the ships, or the planes. And so, uh, <laughs> Fuchita was thwarted in that attempt, but that showed again his energies and his desire as a warrior, as a samurai, yeah. uh, to get back into the fray and the fight once again. Mm -hmm. And some of the research I've done indicates that if, if his recommendation, he thought a second, a third, maybe even a fourth attack, that it would have crippled the uh, American forces uh, so that we maybe... It would have been several years yeah. before we could have gotten the force out in the Pacific. And of course, the war was at its height in Europe, don't you see? And uh, so, uh, for this reason, uh, had we not been able to get back into the fight in the Pacific, things could have gone much worse for us in Europe, I believe. Mm -hmm. But Fachita, uh, Fachita knew that, and he told me, as we traveled together, uh, he said our objective was uh, to knock out the fleet. We thought that we had a 50-50 chance. They didn't think they were going to complete uh, an element of surprise in that raid. They felt that they, they could just get to the place where they had a 50-50 chance to pursue their goals mm -hmm. in the Pacific and in Asia. That would be enough for them. You might be wondering, uh, where is Captain Fuchita? Why don't you have him on the program? Well, he's deceased. What, he, uh, in the 70s? Did 76. He, do? Uh, he went to be with the Lord. And so he can't be here to share his testimony and uh, challenge you to open your heart to Christ. If he were here, you heard him share the gospel and give his testimony, what, what would he say? How would he put it? He would have put it very simply at the end of his story, wherever he told it, uh, he would give an invitation himself. And although his English was a little broken, yet everybody understood mm -hmm. when he said, my friend, God forgave me, and he can forgive you too. 
And he would further say, I'm not interested in gaining empire for Japan or anything else. I'm interested in one thing, in seeing the kingdom of God come into a person's heart. And then I know, as that happens, I'll see that person in eternity. Mm. And he opened up his meeting to see souls come. And really, many, many people came to the Lord under his ministry that he had in this country and around the world. Well, thank you, Jack. It's thank been, you, Ted. Uh, it's been really fun and interesting, and uh, we'll continue to talk <laughs> after we go off the air. <laughs> and thank you for listening. God bless each one of you, and good night. 1941, a date which will live in infamy. The United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. The United States was at peace with that nation and at the solicitation of Japan was still in conversation with its government and its emperor looking for the maintenance of peace in the Pacific. Japan has therefore undertaken a surprise offensive extending throughout the Pacific area. The facts of yesterday and today speak for themselves. The people of the United States have already formed their opinions and well understand the implications to the very life and safety of our nation. With confidence in our armed forces, with the unbounding determination of our people, we will gain the inevitable triumph, so help us God. <laughs>